neutral density filters. Now these bits of glass are a staple in most photographers kit. However, to get a good quality one, you're looking at spending two or three hundred dollars on a single filter. However, there are ways you can get the same effects using a few different techniques and a little bit of post-production, and then you don't have to spend a lot of money on such a small bit of glass. And that's what they don't want you to know. And that is why this is one of photography's best kept secrets. Maybe as a beginner photographer, you're looking at other people's images and wondering how they're able to achieve those effects. You might be in a scene where there's a lot of dynamic range and you can't quite get the exposure of the sky to match the foreground. Or maybe you're trying to do long exposures yourself and you wanna get that silky smooth water or some cloud movement in the sky. But no matter what settings you put on your camera and how much you close up that aperture, you're not getting the shutter speeds that you need to get those effects. And that is, of course, when filters can come in really useful, especially neutral density filters. However, the temptation when you're first getting into photography and you want to buy some filters is to buy cheap ones. And that's fair enough. It's a great way to experiment. But cheap filters will often leave kind of horrible green or magenta color casts on images. Or worse, really bad vignetting, especially at wide angles. So to negate those, you have to invest a lot of money, which you might not want to do when you're first starting out. If you pay two or three hundred dollars for a filter, a lot of those issues go away. However, there is a third option, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. There are ways we can achieve those effects in post-production and in the field without the use of a filter at all. Now, obviously, I do own some filters and I do own some very expensive ones. However, I choose not to use them a lot of the time. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And this is one of them. Mountains. Now, as you probably realize, the mountains break the horizon line. They come up out of the ground and into the sky. So the thing with neutral density filters or graduate neutral densities is they tend to have a relatively straight graduate line. Obviously it fades from kind of a darker to a lighter, but it is straight. So what you find if you're using graduate neutral density filters on a scene like this is to darken the sky, you're probably also going to darken part of the mountain. And then you might find that you're actually in post-production, you're raising the shadows or bringing up the brightness and exposure of the mountain anyway to counteract your neutral density filter. So why not just use a different technique, not use the neutral density filter and combine exposures? So how do you get around it if you're not gonna be using a graduate neutral density filter? Well, this is a pretty straightforward technique and a lot of you have probably already heard of it, but I tend to just use exposure blending. So you can see from a scene like this at the moment, the sky behind me is pretty blown out if I expose correctly kind of for the foreground or for myself. So there's a fair amount of dynamic range. So rather than using that neutral density filter to kind of darken the sky, which would also darken the mountain, I'm going to take a series of images at different exposures and blend those together in post. It's pretty easy nowadays on almost any modern day camera to set your camera to automatically expose in what we would call brackets. So this camera, for example, will do two shots underexposed, the exposure I choose, and then two stops overexposed as well. And I can choose where that sits. So I can set up my camera, put it on a timer. It will take those five images and then I'll have all the detail and dynamic range I need, and I can blend those together in post, and I don't have to mess around with filters now here in the cold. So the exposure blending is a relatively straightforward technique, but getting that long exposure effect without using long exposures is a little bit more complicated but probably not as hard as you think. But the first step is to find a location that will work for a long exposure or you need to get that silky smooth water or some cloud movement in the sky. So I'm here next to the river with a good bit of moving water just below me here. And rather than freeze that, I wanna make that look like it's silky smooth. 
Now, this probably isn't the world's most exciting composition by any means, but for the sake of demonstrating this technique, it's gonna work really well. Now, obviously, if I had a filter with me, I could pop that filter on the front, it would cut out a bunch of light, and I could probably slow this exposure right down to maybe even 30 seconds, as we are in the shade here already anyway. However, if you don't have a big fancy filter, or if you don't wanna get that color cast from a cheaper filter, what we can do is set the camera to take multiple images. So I'm gonna put this camera on, taking a picture maybe once every 10 seconds, and it's gonna be taking a picture relatively quickly, like with a 150th shutter speed or, or something around there. And I'm probably gonna take 20 or 30 of those, and then I'll show you how to put those together in post in just a second. So firstly, exposure blending. Now, there are a few different techniques and a few different ways you can do this. Some of them are much more complicated than others, but to be honest with you, that's probably a video in itself. So today, I'm just gonna show you one of the simplest ways to combine two different exposures in Lightroom. And for this example, I'm just choosing two images, actually, from Lake Minnewanka. We've got one image here of the sky when it's darker, and then a second image that's a brighter exposure, exposed for the mountain and the foreground. And I'm gonna blend those two together to get an even exposure throughout the image. So in all honesty, what you might find is if you have a modern camera, that the dynamic range is so good anyway that you just don't really need to even blend the images. So first thing to do is probably just to try it out that way. Give a click on the masks, choose a linear gradient and drag that over the image. That's gonna do a similar job to what a graduate neutral density filter would have done in the field, but you're doing it in post. Once you've got your area selected, you can choose how much kind of fade you want in the feathering and then simply just put the exposure down. And there you go, that's darkened that whole area. But as again, like a glass neutral density filter would, it has also darkened the mountain. So you see we can lift that up and give more light to the mountain or less. That's one super easy way of doing it. However, if you have a lot of dynamic range in the image and you wanna combine those together, you can do that really, really easily in Lightroom as well nowadays. So I've got these two images here. I'm gonna make sure both are selected. I'm gonna right click on those. And then I'm gonna go Photo Merge HDR. Lightroom's gonna do its thing and it's gonna create a HDR preview where it's combined both those images. So as you can see, we've got a lighter foreground and a darker sky. I'll merge those and it will put those together into one single image. And as you can see, that's the final result there and it's done a pretty good job. So we have our darker image, our brighter image, and then our HDR merge there as well. So if you want, you can go through and do a few more tweaks to that, which I'll do quickly. And then here's the final result. And now for blending together those shorter exposures to give the effect of one long exposure. Now this is a little bit more complicated. And whilst I was down there shooting at Mount Kidd with the river in the foreground, I actually ended up taking about 82 images, all one second apart, in a landscape orientation. However, I think that's quite a lot of images for this purpose, and I probably just don't need that many. Normally the more you add, the smoother it will look but I'm actually gonna use about 30 images just because that will be a bit easier on my computer. So I've got all of those images that I took by the river in Lightroom now, but I've only selected the first 30 of them. As I mentioned, this will just be less intensive on my computer, and to be honest with you, I just don't think I need all of them. But I've selected all 30 of them in Lightroom below, and I've done a few adjustments here as well, just to make sure they all match. I've lifted the shadows, put down the highlights, added a little bit of contrast and a few other bits but we can still do some more editing later on anyway. Now I've selected all of these images along the bottom here. You can see there's a bunch of them that have been selected. I'm actually just gonna right click those and edit in Photoshop, but I'm gonna open them as layers in Photoshop. And like I mentioned, with a lot of files, a lot of raw files, I think these are 20 megapixel files, that is gonna take a little bit of time. Now you can see here on the right hand side that all 30 layers are now loaded into Photoshop. And the first thing I'm actually gonna do is just duplicate this top layer 
by right clicking on it and going to duplicate layer and just clicking OK. That's going to be a layer we're going to use later on. And then what I'm going to do below that, I'm going to click the layer just below and highlight all the other layers so they're all selected and right click those and go convert to smart object. Again, that's probably going to take a minute or two depending on your laptop and how many files you're using, but that's actually going to put them all into one smart group folder. As you can see, it's done that now, and that was actually pretty quick. So now we've got this, I'm going to go up to Layer, Smart Objects, down to Stack Mode, and I'm going to choose Mean. This will kind of average out the pixels, so those pixels that have moved, which is the running water, are going to then become a little bit blurrier. It's going to kind of give the average of each pixel. Is it white sometimes? Is it blue? Is it black? And then it's going to give that kind of long exposure effect. But what it will do is it will do that all over the image. So it will do it in the clouds, it will do it in the tree movement, it will do it in other pieces as well. So anything else that's moved throughout your exposure times or throughout the period of time you were taking pictures for is also going to appear a little bit blurry. So that's why we keep this top layer. So here we've got the bottom layer here with what kind of looks like a bit of a long exposure effect, but you can see here maybe it's a little bit blurrier in the trees. And then my top layer that I saved from before has a bit more sharpness in and amongst the trees. So what I can do with these two is actually use them to edit out certain parts of the image. And realistically, I only want that long exposure effect on the river itself. So I'll select this top layer. I'll add a mask to it. And then I'll just use a brush, use a black brush here and then paint in the areas that I want to look like they are a long exposure. So I'll just roughly do that through here and all the way through the river, just to show you here. It doesn't matter too much if there's a little bit of an overlap, but you can work on this and make this as accurate as you want it to be. And there we have it. Now we have what looks like a long exposure in the river. And I'm going to save that, take that back into Lightroom, do a few more tweaks on it. I might get rid of some of these power lines. And here's the final result. So there you have it, two different techniques you can use to get the effect of using those filters without actually having to buy them. But let me know what you think. Do you like to use filters or would you prefer to do more post-processing? I know it's great to get stuff in the field, but if you don't have to invest the money and you can try the techniques without, that's good too. Let me know what you think in the comments. But once again, thank you so much for watching.